Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. I think the only reason why I taped my stick was because everybody else did. Yeah. yeah. I would, right? If you would have came to training camp with no tape, to. I would have been like, this guy's cut. Yeah. we got to get rid of this guy. Yeah. He doesn't know how to put tape on his stick. But yeah, if you look like at, he doesn't even tape on his stick. How if, you if you look at Bobby, Bobby's stick, Bobby used one strip. One. One. Really? Yeah. I mean... Yeah. Where? Where was the strip at? Super near the heel. No, yeah, near, the heel. Yeah. near the heel. So yeah. it doesn't really near serve the heel. a purpose, and not using it served a better purpose than using it. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down, and I never stayed down. And I was <laughs> vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> All right, let's get um, let's get rolling here. And listen, if and we've talked about this, certainly, you and I, um, the incident um, that uh, <laughs> Knuckles did uh, when I hit you in the chops, and yep, look, yep. well, everybody calls it a butt end. I say I hit you with my glove. But regardless, oh, I, I know you did. <laughs> what I did was totally out of line. It was out of character for me. I'd never done something like that. And it's the one thing that I was ashamed of. The one regret I have during uh, my National Hockey League career. So yeah. I, I want to address that right off the hop because so many people, I still see people and that's the one thing they always oh, hit me with, especially when I'm home. And I've apologized to you, and you've accepted I that, and I appreciate like that. I remember 10, 15 years ago, we were playing in somewhere in the Maritimes, and we're on the bench together, and he turned to me and go, Nifty, i got to tell you, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was like 25 years later. Now it's like 40 years later. He's like, I thought about <laughs> it. I know, thought about like, it. I feel bad about yeah, it. Come on. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I hope you don't think about it too much because I don't. Well, I, so, I don't. It's yeah. only when people bring it up because other people won't let me forget it. Oh, and I know. Certainly. Or me. Or me. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see you. <laughs> you know, but um, no, I, I was joking. I said, I was thinking, you know, why didn't you just hit me, sucker me or something and, and go me into fighting? I said, then I thought, well, maybe you saw my bouts against Schultz and Sittler earlier in my career and you were a little nervous. <laughs> Did you get suspended well, for that, Nux? I got eight game suspension, Tim. Yeah. Yep. Back I then, got, too. That's I got Hammett. <laughs> yeah, wow. I got Hammett. And uh, I got a new bridge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your teeth look good, buddy. Listen, join the club. <laughs> I just had these done again because uh, my finally my uh, my old bridge were attached to uh, teeth, and then yeah, those went post. those went on me. So now I no now mm -hmm. I got post put in. Yeah. I said now my mouth is worth more than my car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know mine's worth more is. than my house, right? Yeah. <laughs> all yeah. of these uh, all, implants, all of they're all implants. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I always say it. I said, yeah. listen, everybody bleeds in this game. And, you know, it's funny. I was watching yeah. your highlight reel, a uh, couple of them, actually, and some really good ones. And one thing I noticed on a couple of them, they had you on the bench. And one time on the bench, you had a big gash on your forehead. And then another one, you had a black eye. Like, I'm like, what the hell? What happened to you there? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> you don't. You, well, well, you, know, you have game, one big no, black eye. My game was making defensemen look silly. And when you make them look silly, they, they kind of take, you know. So that was, to me, you know, growing up, I was always a goal scorer. I wasn't a tough guy, obviously. Um, so my form of intimidation is to get other people pissed off. So they take, you know, shots at me and draw a penalty. Then, you know, that's that's to help the team, maybe score a power play goal and we win the game. I mean, that was my form of getting into their heads was to make defensemen, big guys, look silly. And in those days, you could beat them one on one. You could stick the puck between their stick and their feet and, you know, force them to look down. And today, you'll hardly see anybody beat anybody one on one. They, they skate too well today. No, well, that's Niff, a good point. 
That's yeah, a good point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, listen, it, it's funny. Like, as a one-on-one player, you're probably, for me, one of the best, if not the best one-on-one player I ever played against. I well, hated one on one. Until right? a guy named Mario came along. Then he well, might... <laughs> Mario too. Mario and and, and <laughs> Gretz was, you know, but they were different. Yeah. They were no, it was uh, all uh, different ways to do it. Yeah, yeah th- there was, but one on one player like you were, I, and I t- I say that because I know, I I knew the sentiment on our bench, and I knew the sentiment in me. Whenever you got the puck and you were coming through the neutral zone, everybody's ass tightened up. Everybody's everybody on the bench, and certainly the two defensemen you were going at, and you would come down like a little head shake, leave the puck go, the puck would go by, and you're on your heels, and then next thing you buy him and you're alone, and people are just sitting on the bench. You look at someone, how the fuck did he do that? And well, you know, and, and you're, I you're say kind. that because it, it, I've seen it. But no, I was but saying the it. same thing. I was yeah. watching your highlights. You had a, the background music was America, like magic. <laughs> something, something, something. Yeah, magic. You can do yeah, yeah. magic. You know, yeah, what I, you know what I say about uh, highlight films? They're great because they all go in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but Chris is right, though. It's like you had this, like you would move and the, you'd, the puck wouldn't. And it was just like this magic magic. Well, like, you know, crazy. I learned I learned that the, the most effective way to beat a guy is not to have the puck on your stick. And I always joke that defensemen weren't that smart because, you know, as you know, Nux, when they're trained to look at you. So they, they, they're they trained not to take their eyes off your body. But I used to like to put the puck between their stick and their skate so they can actually still see it. And they got to look down. I mean, they can't help but look down. And once they look at the puck, they're gone. And it didn't work every time. I got knocked on my butt many, many, many times. But uh, it's a, a law of averages. A lot of that. But there's one guy that you played with that I could never beat. And you probably. Big Larry. Guess. Yeah. I'm big Larry. Le- he was on the left side. I'm coming down the right wing. And I don't care how many times you do this. No. He was just too strong. He had too big a reach. You know, you couldn't get around him. No. <clears throat> it's funny. So, um, would you, that's a good point, though. Would you, so, a guy like him, would you notice that when he's on and just try to, you know, take everything to the other D man. I would, I used to do that, well, but that. Mine was not skill. It was like just afraid to get hit by someone. So I just I learned. Like, I learned. Uh, I learned after um, getting. You know, when I first came up, I tried to beat everybody, and that was hazardous to your health. And then I, I got taught. You know, well, you know, mix it up, go wide, turn, come back, make the pass to the late guy. And, you know, so I didn't always try to beat guys. So that way, they didn't know exactly what I was going to do every time, but. With Larry, you know, I try it at times. Uh, I always like to cut in the middle, uh, but you got to keep your head up. And once you count in the middle, the defensemen get a little confused. They don't know who, who, who should take them. Should I take them? Should you take them? And there's one highlight film I love. It's in Montreal. And I, I went to the middle, and the le- right defenseman came over and ran into the left defenseman. But they never continued the play because I didn't score on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah, it's just, you know. It happened once in a while, and luckily they caught it on film. <laughs> so you're born in Toronto. Uh, you played yeah. minor hockey there, uh, Wexford uh, team. Uh, you, Toronto you Young Nats one... was, uh, was the big team. When I was 13, I went to the Toronto Young Nationals, and I got a coach by the name of Frank Miller. And I'm sure in your career you had a coach that really changed your game around. Yeah. And he was the guy, 13 to 16, Improved my skating immensely to the point where I got six full scholarship offers, got drafted by Oshawa Generals. Otherwise, I was a small, skinny kid. I had a knack of scoring, but I, you know, I wasn't very strong on my skates. And he, I actually invited him to be on the ice the night of my retirement. Him and Don Cherry were the two coaches on the ice with me. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Um, how about I was going to ask you about Glenn Mortley. Uh, you played oh, yeah. for him, like that was you. You had him since you were a kid when you started playing, right? Yeah. All the way up until thirteen years old, right? I don't. I don't know if that was normal in those days, but playing for Wexford, it was house league when I started. I mean, commercial plumbing and heating were our sponsors. Uh, yeah. We actually went to the Quebec Pee Wee tournament uh, as with Wexford. That was my last year with them. But he was great. You know, when you have your that kind of coach, when you're a young kid that makes the game fun, and we had a good team, and he'd always put us in tournaments that we'd have a shot of winning. 
and we always seem to. Timmy Tyke tournament, all these tournaments. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. It kept me in the game, kept me interested, made me love the game. And then uh, by the time of Bantam, the minor Bantam, it was time to move. Uh, they wanted him to move back with the young kids, so it was time for us to move on. And that's how I ended up with the Toronto Young National. Yeah. So um, then it, it comes to your junior career, and you go off to Oshawa. Now, was there any – did you feel any heat there, or were you, were you psyched going to Oshawa knowing that number four – played in Oshawa before you, Bobby Orr? Well, that, that had a little to do with it. But, uh, no, when I actually got drafted at 16, I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong enough. In Canada, as you probably know, uh, the, uh, Junior A hockey's on TV. I mean, I was watching yeah. them since I was a kid, the Toronto Marlboros, Hamilton Red Wings. These guys were like pros. So now I get drafted by Oshawa. I'm 16 years old, but I'm not, I'm not ready yet. So I played a year of B in Toronto for the Toronto Young Nationals. And then I, that's why I only played two years of A. I made it the next year when I was 17. In those days, you had to be 20 to be drafted. So I only played two years with Oshawa. But it was it was an honor to be in. It was only half an hour from my house in Toronto. I got to keep the yeah. 60 bucks a, 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 a week, you know. <laughs> well, what was, how'd you, you go from, you team. went from like 70 points to 140 points in, in five extra I games? Know. Out. I, don't, I, <laughs> I don't know. One, one reason was my left winger was Billy Lockheed. And you, you probably don't know that name, but he scored 52 that year. We, we, and he got drafted by the Red Wings, who weren't all that great in those days. I could not believe he didn't make it. He was a big scrap and left winger, could fight, score goals, and he never made it in Detroit. But that's what happened. I was just out on a great line. Uh, we had a good team. We didn't do much in the playoffs, but uh, everything seemed to go in. I always said, if you're ever going to have a great year, you have it on your draft year. And I got lucky. That was my, my year. So... Uh, Small town Canada, um, and and uh, you're in Oshawa, and you get drafted by the New York Rangers in the first round. Now, I gotta know, leaving Canada the first time, you're going away to the to the Big Apple. What's that like when you're a young kid again, or you're 20 years old, going to New York that first year? What was that like? It must have been like just awestruck well, you know, coming into I never, New York. I never made it to New York that first year. <laughs> I went to training camp in 73, and if you remember, the Bruins and Rangers played for the Cup in 72, yeah. and the Bruins beat them in six. So when I got yeah. to camp, the, 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 the Rangers still had a Stanley Cup caliber team. And uh, even though you know, the cat, you know, Emil Francis, told me I had a good camp, they wanted me to go down to their minor league team and get some seasoning. So they sent me to their team in Providence, Rhode Island. So I was in living in New England when I was 19 years old. I lived in Cranston, Rhode Island. The very first year they built the Duncan Center, the Civic Center, and uh, had a great. It was a great way to break me into the United States, a different way of life than I was used to. Living on my own because I lived at home during junior, and yeah. uh, I got my new uh, 73 Pontiac Grand Am with my signing bonus. And uh, took off for the United States and never go back, really, just to visit. And uh, I loved it. I loved the States right from the get-go. Yeah. Well, what was a training camp like then? Yeah, was that's it, what yeah. I was wanting, the training camp. Testing that what first doing? one. <laughs> Not quite as strenuous as today, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, all of a sudden, I'm in there. I'm 19 years old. I'm playing against men now. I mean, they got, you know, Jill Marat, uh, you know. Uh, Dale Rolfe. He, Dale Raw, Peter Stumkowski, uh, Eddie Jockerman in net. I mean, I I have Eddie's hockey card. You know, I yeah. kept watching it. And all yeah. I'm on the uh, Brad Park, Jean, uh, Rod Gilbert, Jean Rattel, all, all my heroes. You know, it was like, right, when you're that age. And uh, I was in awe. But, you know, I tried to do the best I could. But uh, I didn't look at it as a demotion. I, I took it as another step in the ladder, you know, because it, it was always happened to me. I never – I had to, you know – go uh, to somewhere to get ready for the big time. And it was the right move to do because I won rookie of the year that year in the American League. Had a good year, made the first all-star team, I think. And we actually went to the Calder Cup finals, lost to Hershey in five. Yeah. Well, you had great numbers in Providence, no question. You were actually 
closer to Boston than you were to New York at the time. And I don't think I and... ever went to Boston <laughs> except to play against the Braves. Honestly, I didn't know it. Who? I never dreamed I'd be a Boston Bruin. You know, <laughs> right, I, but I, when I, you I just think of it, to get to New York. <laughs> yeah, and how close you were to the place you ended up playing, living, and ironic. absolutely loving. And yeah, um, so you 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 go to New York, following you, you have two decent seasons. What was that like? Because Nif, Nif was Phil was there at the time, wasn't he? Phil Esposito no, or had you, he not? No, not not the first year. Not he didn't get year. the second year. He was there. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. My okay. first year, I, I got off to a real good start. I had 18 goals by Christmas. I I had a shot at the rookie of the year. And early January, I ended up, we were playing Vancouver, and I, I was doing one of my moves around um, the count. I, I played for Philadelphia, big big guy, big defenseman. Bob Daly? And Bob Daly. And Bob's stick came around. The stick was at his waist, but it was in my mouth. And uh, I lost my <laughs> first four. I lost my first four teeth and 16 stitches inside and out. And they take me on the road. Now, I, I, uh, they put a football helmet on me. I looked like Fran Tarkenton. It was like, hit me here, <laughs> right? And so we go into Chicago. We go into uh, Minnesota, um, St. Louis. And a week later, we're in Minnesota playing the North Stars. And I haven't eaten very well all week because uh, I couldn't. And uh, they weren't all that concerned in those days. And I'll, I think it was early in the second period. I think it was Hextall came in to run me in the corner, and I went to slide the check. I, my leg buckled. I went over on my ankle, and I broke my ankle a week later. Uh, so that's why I only played. Hextall, like the, Hextall like the goalie? Dennis. No, uh, his, his, oh, his, his uncle Dennis. or whatever. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah. he, he hardly hit me that, in my memory. It wasn't, you know, he came in to hit me like anybody would, but I went to slide the check. I went over on my own leg. Broke my ankle a week later, and there goes rookie of the year. So I came back, scored four more goals that year, but uh, uh, that was it. So the next year, I was, wanted to get off to a good start, but they um, early in the year they made the big trade for Espo. So I, I got a chance to play with Espo, which was a great honor in those days. But the team never joked. Yeah. We never made the playoffs that year, and I'll show you. You can probably see it on here. So what what. What got me traded was um, when they when they um, traded Derek. I don't remember Derek uh, Sanderson was on the team my first year, and, and it was great. Derek was awesome. We had a lot of fun together, you know. Um, I guess me, me him, and, <laughs> and your buddy Gresh. So just tell, ask Gresh. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we... So they traded Derek early the next year, and the owner. Uh, a couple of weeks later, puts an article in the paper saying the reason they traded Derek was he was getting two of the younger players into training problems, Rick Middleton and Ron Greshner. They put our names <laughs> in the friggin' paper. So I didn't, I took offense yeah, to it. Tough. I didn't say anything right away. And a couple of weeks later, a reporter came in and asked me about it. And I said, uh, I can't believe, the only thing I said, I can't believe a well-educated man like Bill Jennings, who was the owner, could believe of such gossip because it wasn't true. Next day, I walk into practice. One of the, my teammates hands me the New York Post, and I, I I open it up to the um, I open it up to the sports section, and there's the headline. What's it? I can't. It's a little blurry. Middleton, Middleton takes shot fake at the boss. Shot. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> that was the headline in the Post the next day, and that was. Um, that was February 18th, 1976, and I got traded three months later. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. Not and, and Gresh. It, not Gresh, me. Not Gresh. <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, well, let's face it. That party scene was pretty bit, big back in the day. A lot of guys well, went out, had fun. It was back in the day, yeah, yeah, drinking was, beers. And, you know, on the road. It was, it was part of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You guys was, weren't playing uh, video games or anything like that? I, I, just... No, they weren't around, no. So what, what <laughs> happened was on Sunday nights, as you know, the, the, the Rangers played at Madison Square, and the Jets and the Giants yeah. would play in the afternoon. So there was a bar on First Avenue called the Tittle Tattle that Derek was friends with the guy who ran it, of course. So 
we'd go there, the Jets, the Giants, and the Rangers would all be in there till four in the morning. We just had to make it back to Long Beach, Long Island for practice Monday morning. And uh, so uh, that was Studio 54 wasn't even there yet. They didn't get there till 76, no. thank God. But. <laughs> Well, you know, I played in New York at the end, well, near the end of my career. Yeah. And I'm telling you, there were a couple nights there going to Fleming's. You know, yeah. I get home at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm 30 years old now, and I'm going, I, I, I can't be doing this. It's the city that never this sleeps. Is... Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. So you can imagine it doesn't, when, you're, that's for sure. when you're 20, 21 years old, <laughs> 1974, yeah. 75, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that could be like... a... Yeah. That would have been a curse for me if I got drafted by the Rangers <laughs> well, and went there for me first. too. But luckily, I got traded to a, a, a better team because we didn't make the playoffs that year, and I get traded to a, uh, a a perennial, you know, contender for the cup. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we'll we'll talk about so that trade. We know um, <clears throat> basically why you got traded, but for the life of me, and I have all the respect in the world, and I absolutely love John Ferguson. Yeah, yeah. But what the hell was he thinking? And no, respect it, for Ken Hodge, too. But Ken Hodge, 10 years older than you, and they make an well, even trade. Middle, I, I, middle I, I 10 wait, were you? I connected the dots. So I get asked that, too, and I'm like, I don't know. But I think what happened was Fergie came in. He was the third coach that year, and he was the GM because they fired Emil Francis. All right? Now, do you remember... You, you remember the series of the century, Canada against Russia, right? 1972. Yeah. You remember yeah. who the head coach was? Mm -mm. Harry Sinden. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, the it's, one over in the, the Russian yeah, series. Yeah, the okay. Yeah, yeah. Canada, foreign Russia. I mean, being, yeah, being I thought American, you were talking about the other one. Being American, okay. you probably didn't watch it as much as us. No, I did. Yeah. I, I listened. To the last game, because well, Harry Sinden was coaching. Right. Do you remember who his assistant was? Um. T was it TJ? John Ferguson. No. John Ferguson. Fergie. So there's okay. the relationship. Who was oh, the, the top player on the team? Phil Esposito, because oh. Bobby couldn't play because of his knees. So there's the triangle yeah. right there. So jump ahead three years. Espo gets traded to New York. Fergie's the coach and GM. Yeah. Article in the paper, the owners probably get rid of this kid, you know. And uh, Fergie's got all this pressure on him. And Espo's hounding him, from what I heard later, to, get, to get, get a winger, one of his old wingers. Then I find out when I get to Boston that Don Cherry has soured on Kenny, maybe not even dress him. So that's how it happened. They Bruins wanted, wanted to get rid of Kenny. They traded up for 10 years difference. Uh, Espo uh, was hounding Fergie. You know Espo. He's hounding Fergie. Get one yeah. right where you And I think that's, Get that's, Haji. What, that's what happened. They, you know, so it wasn't, I don't know if this is a typo, but it wasn't like, were you minus 38? Sorry, I just had to bring this you up. You know what? It's a my... very good possibility. <laughs> it had nothing to do with it. Very, very good possibility. Because, <laughs> you know, if, if Espo wasn't back checking, <laughs> I wasn't back checking. <laughs> No, I told you, the, yeah. we, the team wasn't bad. We just never gelled that year. That was a JD's first year, John Davidson. I mean, it was, yeah. we just couldn't get out of our own way. No. Well, you go to Boston, and certainly the best thing that ever happened to you in your career, and have just you, you get off to a, a, a great start there, and, and, and Grapes being the coach. How was that coming in first with Grapes? How was he with you? You know, Grapes <laughs> loves – Listen, he loves tough guys. We oh, know I, that. No He's a tough coach, hot ass. How no was he with with the how was he with the better players well, though? I'll like I'll, I'll tell guys. you a funny story how we met. And Don and I always had this uh, uh, relationship, uh, you know, that we bust each other at times. And I didn't really know him, but I knew of him because he coached Rochester the year I played at Providence. And Johnny Winsick, okay. Johnny was his tough guy. So we had a couple of balls, yeah. you know, so we knew each other. And so I get to Boston first, uh, first uh, day on the ice and I'm out there, you know, I, I, I had met cash the night before at the hotel. 
I get to meet Peter McNabb. He just got traded, ended up my roommate for eight years. God bless him. You know, we lost him last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And all the other guys, right? But I knew Raddy for, and, and Parky from New York. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't that new to me. But I hadn't met Don. So we go out skating on the ice. I'm skating around. This is my memory of it anyways. With uh, Cash and, and Maxie and, and Bobby Smots, I think. So Don comes over. Ricky takes, Boy. <laughs> Ricky right? Boy. Ricky Boy. Ricky Boy. Hey, you're looking a little, uh, <laughs> you, so you heard the story. You're looking a little bigger. He says, uh, you've been working out? I, and I just looked at him and said, <laughs> No, Don, I had a good summer. <laughs> the only time I ever saw Don speechless, Bobby Smuts was laughing so hard he fell on the ice. And we haven't even started to practice yet. And that was my very first interaction with him. And since then, you know, it's been the same. He busted me when he was when he came um, when he retired my jersey. He got up and told uh, the audience that they, he had to introduce me to the goalie at the end of the first year because I never came back. <laughs> you know, so we always had that relationship, and that's how it got off to a start. But, he, you know, I got a hat trick. My first game was a Bruin. I got 20 on the whole year because Don never played me. He dressed me, but he never put me on a, a regular line because he said he wanted to teach me the, the whole game, both ends of the ice. I don't know if that was true. I thought I was doing okay. But when you come from New York at minus 38, maybe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, maybe, there's only one way to go after this maybe minus 38. Had a point. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. you, you certainly were that 200 foot player and played both ends of the, well, the ring. There's helped, no question he about teach, it. He helped teach me. So by the time I got to the 80s, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Cheevers played me first minute, last minute, power play, penalty kill. I never killed a penalty. Till the eighties, Don Cherry would never yeah. have to kill a pill. He had he had Shepherd and Mark yeah. Ott and all those guys. You know, so yeah. So uh, I, and I gotta ask you because and listen, I had Taz on here, and oh, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, I have a relationship with some of the the guys that I played against, and right. some I played with when I was a Bruin, and Ray. Right, right. And I can on and I say this because I was a huge Bruins fan, Rick. Growing well, I, up, I would imagine I was, you would be. Yeah. And 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 I looked up to those guys. I love Bobby Orr. I look at um that stretch where the Canadians win four straight. And I said this to Terry at the time, not so much, but I was when we would beat you in the playoffs and we get in line and shake hands. You know, people think, you know, okay, there's not much said. I, I always felt bad for certain guys. Some guys right. I didn't give a shit about, right, right. but certain guys I felt bad for. And you were one of them. Taz was the other one, and Ray Bork was one. But when I look at your career, you get to Boston there in all those years, how difficult that must have been having to face that team every year in the playoffs. It was a great rivalry, this unbelievable rivalry. And and you came so goddamn close. And I was still a Bruins fan. I was drafted in 78 right. by the Habs. And you guys were playing the playoffs. They were going for their fourth Stanley Cup in a row, right. the Habs. And we all know what happened. But how... Well, how, much do you hate the Montre- how much do you hate the Montreal Canadiens? <laughs> well, like, you, you just- it, it's funny because I was just saying this um, the other night. They asked me to go into the Bru- uh, one of the air nights, asked me to go in the Bruins dressing room before the game and read the lineup. I guess they do it every once in a while. And they're yeah. playing Montreal, right? So I, I got to say a few words. So I said, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I lost two Stanley Cups to these guys in the late 70s. And I grew up in Toronto, and I basically have hated them since I was six friggin' years old. So go out and kick their ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when you grow up in Toronto, you automatically hate Montreal. You know the whole French English yeah. thing and everything. So, honestly, yeah, I've hated Montreal since I was six years old. But coming from New York and not making the playoffs that year, and all of a sudden you're in the Stanley Cup playoffs the next year, I went from one end of the spectrum to the other. I didn't care who we were going to play. We had to get through Philadelphia before that, beat them four straight. Yeah. I mean, we were we were sailing, and then we hit the wall. Yeah. I mean, 77, that team 
had nine guys go to the Hall of Fame, you know. Yeah. 78, they had lost, I think, Lemaire and Cornwallie, but, you know, they were still powerful. And we got to, we won two at home, you know, which was awesome. And we thought we had a shot, and we just couldn't climb the mountain. And then 79, God. we knew we could beat them. And it wasn't the finals, it was the semifinals. And by 79, yeah. their team had changed They beat enough. the Rangers. Yeah. yeah. That we thought, we, we can beat them this time. We can. We took them to seven. And we had them in the second period. We owned them. We're up 3-1 going into the third period. Never in that position before. And we knew we were getting the penalty problems. Are you kidding me? The fans were going to call a couple, you know. And yeah. uh, they tied it, and I scored with four minutes to go. And there was a – I'll give you a, a funny quick story. We had a third goalie in the audience, you know, how you always dress a third guy in a suit, yeah. named Jim Seaweed Petty. I think he still holds the record in the Eastern League for most penalty minutes by a goalie. But <laughs> So Seaweed <laughs> comes to me in between the second and third period, and he, he leans down, and he goes, I've been watching Dryden. He likes to put his paddle down, you know, like all the goalies do today. He says, you get a chance, yeah. shoot for the far side. It'll go in under the knob. I said, all right, Jim, thanks. So, yeah, I'll keep it. right? So if you look at the, my goal, I was coming around the back of the net on my backhand, and it must have flashed through my head, but it didn't get out far enough. And when I fired it, it hit the inside. He had his paddle down, hit the inside of Dryden's blocker and went in. And we went up 4-3. So if we had a won it, I would have given him all the credit in the world. He would have yeah. been a hero. Oh, I- <laughs> And, Poor seaweed. Yeah, <laughs> and we lost, and nobody ever heard that story. And he just no, passed. No. He just passed away a couple of years ago, too, unfortunately. But no, it was a challenge, and you know, it, it made you be a better player because you always had to be on top of your game, especially in the Montreal Forum. It was Yankee yeah. Stadium, you know. You, you so even though you didn't like them too much you got up for the game and that was the biggest challenge of your career. And I, I reveled it. I love playing in there. I really did. Didn't win yeah. a lot, yeah. especially in the seventies, but oh. I loved it. You know, I, it, it's like I said that, yeah, even though I was drafted, I'm still a Bruins fan because I'm drafted. I was drafted in the 17th round. Yeah. Like everybody, yeah, right. they thought, he doesn't have a chance. He's just going to go to training camp. He's gone. See you later. Right. But I was still a right. Bruins fan, and I couldn't believe it. And, and in in defense of the crowd calling penalties in Montreal, <laughs> that penalty you know they was have too many men on. Sway. No, I know. No, I'm not <laughs> that was, about that. No, but I'm that penalty that was now. self-inflicted. It that was. that it penalty was. was self-inflicted. And John D'Amico no. yeah. it gave – you guys, every chance to get well, off did. the ice, he and finally he had to call it, right? And I mean, surpri- it, it killed me. Know, what, what's surprising is when guys jump on the ice, you automatically count sometimes. You know, yeah. you know who's on it. We didn't, nobody had a clue. And I didn't even, I forgot that I was one of the guys on the ice. I, I didn't look at that tape of that game for 15 years. I couldn't. But all of a sudden, who jumped on? Nobody who was it knows. that jumped on? It wasn't who jumped no, on. No, no. Oh, I thought we were going to call him out right now. We're like, <laughs> the truth comes out. Who was it? Well, no, it's wow. who did Don call up. So who wasn't oh. supposed to be out there? Nobody remembers except Don. Yeah. He says he's uh, going to his grave with it. So, But it might have yeah. been me. So it he knows been it. Me. It might have been Stan. I was playing left wing that night with Raddy yeah. and Cash on the right side. And uh, might have been me. I think it might have been either Stan or I that screwed up, but I don't want to try to think about it. Well, regardless, uh, it happened, and then we know how it ended. And God, oh, really? what a heartbreak! I would have played the Rangers. I was sitting out. I would have played the Rangers. Yeah. It would have been. Awesome. You would have beat the Rangers. You, you would have beat the it, Rangers. It would have been easily. tough. They had a good team, but it would have been a good series. I think we could have taken it. Yeah. yeah you, listen, you took Montreal that far. I, 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 I don't all the think. Time. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember sitting on. I, we had my dad put the TV out in the back. We had a little teeny backyard, and we put the TV out there, and we were watching it. We we're all, and then sure enough, Lafleur ties it at the end, and then Lambert. If, if you look at that play, Tim, if, um, yeah. Donnie Marcotte stick maybe six inches from tipping that shot. And yeah, you talk right. about a great shot. You know how hard it is to, to slap a one-timer off of a drop pass that you, you don't even stop. I mean, the accuracy of that yeah. shot. Only one guy in the whole league could do that. 
Even Mike yeah, Bossy. And it I was gay. Think. Bossy was a slot <laughs> yeah. guy. He could score from there. You know how many times they must have practiced that play? Yeah, the two of them. Worked perfect. And Tim, if if you've never seen it, it's just incredible. The game seven when when the uh, Habs beat the Bruins and I, for that. I felt so you know, bad to for get Jilly. to the finals. Jilly Gilbert stood on his yeah, head. That yeah, yeah. I felt so bad. For him. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, then what? Yeah. Did he go to overtime? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I went to we OT. Kind of want it. I saw the overtime mm-hmm. not too long ago, and Donnie Marcotte had a right in front, and, and Dryden was down on his knees at the end right here. You know, oh. so you know it can go either Tim, way. Tim, it was unbelievable. If you Lafleur scored with like a minute something left, like it was crazy, and they tied it, and then it went to OT. But we got so we we get that out of the way, uh, certainly. But what a rivalry um, when you and it's it's a shame because such a good rivalry we don't see anymore. The league is certainly. So many more teams now. There's 32, the original 32. And then, you know, we used to play four exhibition games against each other, right? Two down in Boston and two up in Montreal or somewhere. And then we played Tim eight times against it. Four in Boston and four in Montreal. By the time you got to the playoffs, you just, there was so much shit that happened during the season. It was like well, it, it, it was, it talk- and that wasn't even as bad as the original six. Those guys played each other like twelve times, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You know, or, or more. I don't know, but uh, yeah, more than twelve. You know, and uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, rivalries are born in the playoffs, and yeah. they're always in the playoffs. There, you know, yeah. always in playoffs against Montreal. So that's where the rivalry came from. You look at Detroit, Colorado. I mean, they probably couldn't care less about each other until they played in the playoffs. Then they hated yeah. each other, you know, for many years. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, that's, that's born in the play. And it is unfortunate that uh, over the last decade or so, you know, it, it's not there. So it gets no, replaced yeah. by we, Toronto, Boston, or, you know. Well, even we got excited about the whole, you know, Tampa, Florida series that was at, I don't know what year that was, two years ago, a year ago? Yeah, it was terrible. yeah. yeah Tampa and Florida. <laughs> it, was like, these guys, it was like, what is this? No, it's not, yeah. it's not the same. Uh, but as you said, with so many teams, the odds that you're playing the same team in the playoff year after year after year, um, you know, isn't, isn't going to happen too often. Yeah. So – uh, Niff, geez, there's so much I, I, I want to get to it. You know, I, I saw um, you were named to the All Centennial team. I, I just love, I love the fact that your jersey went up in the Raptors. They, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's incredible the the career you had and what you did for that organization and the way you played, the way you carried yourself. You were a Bruin. You weren't one of those guys either, like you could see in Philadelphia quite a bit, who had a lot of tough guys they played with and they took advantage of it. You never did. Well, it gave me a little more room. It gave me a little more room. No, sure it did. (laughs) But I had a a job to do, and I did my job. I didn't try to do everybody else. No, but, yeah, you did. And it was so great to see your jersey go up. That was awful nice, as you can imagine. And – uh, when, when Cam called me in the summer, he caught me off guard. I had seen no, nobody wore 16 for a few years. Uh, Marco Stern was basically the last guy that, that had worn it. So I thought, eh, yeah. maybe, maybe one day. But I wasn't thinking about it. He often called me on because I was the president of the alumni, and Cam would call me sometimes on alumni. So that's what I thought it was about. And we missed each other. And I called yeah. back. What were you doing when he called? I was just I was at home, as I remember, and um, I got a message from him on my phone. Nifty, uh, give me a call. It was really short, you know. So I called him back, and I missed him. And anyway, we hooked up and small talk, summer talk, house of golf, and blah blah blah. And uh, then he just blurted it out. Hey, uh, well, we've decided we're going to retire your number sixteen. I went, what? I didn't think I heard him right. Uh, and I got emotional. I did. I got a little emotional. My wife came home and she thought somebody died with the look on my face. I said, no, no, no. No, no. <laughs> and so I had wow, four that, months. It, it wasn't until November when they did it. Um, and so I had a long time. You know, it's not very often you're out of the game 30 years and then they retire your jersey. So 
Hello. I had, lost yeah. a, I had lost a lot of friends that were very big supporters of me during my career, both players and personal friends, that I found out all their kids were at the game that night to watch my retirement. So I, wow. I, I wanted to include them in my speech. So I had a lot of work to do to, to make the speech the right way. <laughs> over 30 years, you got a lot of people to thank. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. And it's wow. funny you said that it, they hadn't um, used the jersey for a bit because it, it it happened to me. And by no means do I think my number should be retired, but they they gave it to a guy, Turner Stevenson. He was a first rounder for the Habs. And he wore it for, I think, maybe a year and a half to two years. And he finally changed his number and he said he felt too much pressure because he's the big kid and the tough kid yeah, he yeah. felt too much pressure right. everybody wanted him to fight expected him to fight and he got rid of number 30 he changed his number so they tucked it away again it was gone for the longest time and then I'm, I'm thinking why don't they use my number and i'm not thinking oh they'll retire it someday but they finally took it out for primo uh the kid from Northeastern. Yeah, well, who, I was going to say, Chris, tender. I didn't want to be rude, but I'm like, it's a terrible number. <laughs> well, <laughs> like 30. Do you, well, do you know why, Tim? No, I don't think maybe I do. If you said it, you probably told me. Well, back in that day, the Canadians had so many jerseys retired oh. that when they call guys up, they give them the – because the goalie didn't use – 30 then they had Dryden was 29 and Bunny LaRock was number one. Okay. So 30 became a call up number. Rick Mahaga called up. Right. He wore number 30. He got sent back. And the story is I get called up. They give me number 30. I'm like, oh, yeah. but I'm not going to complain. You I'm, don't know I'm the got story. a goalie's. You're like, yeah, take yeah. it from See what to try to take it back from me. See what I it got does. a goalie's number. I mean, I don't want a fucking goalie's number. <laughs> right, right. So I don't Gump say it. Gump Worsley wore 30. The Gump. Yeah. Gump yeah. Gump so my dad comes up the first time he comes to Montreal. He goes in the pro shop. He said, can you get me a uh, nylon jersey, number 30, please? And the guy said, yeah. Do you think you uh, he will be here long enough for you to wear it? And my father says, I don't give a <laughs> no, shit how long really? he's here. <laughs> yeah, I swear to God. The guy said, because it happened before. Maha came up, someone bought Maha jersey. Right, right. And then he got sent back down. So Henry said, I don't give a shit if he's here for a game or he's right. here for the rest yeah, of his career. Yeah. No, you got to get Give it. me the jersey. <laughs> so... Henry gets the jersey, Rick, and probably wearing and everything. And I'm here for about two weeks. And I said, hey, I was talking one night in the phone. I said, Dad, I'm thinking of changing my number. I, I don't want number 30. You know, it's a goalie's number. He said, God damn it. He said, wear that jersey. Wear that. Make something out of that number 30. And I'm yeah. thinking, you cheap bastard. You just don't <laughs> yeah. want to buy another yeah. jersey, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And anyway, I, I did wear it. And. I was fortunate enough to have it everywhere I, I went. But well, um, you know, I always felt I never heard that, Nux. That's yeah. amazing. That's a credible story. I always Funny. felt that the job you guys did, you know, Terry, Stan, you know, um, it never gets recognized enough, and and especially by the Hall of Fame. You know, I really think there should be a category for the guys that you know gave up so much, and and yeah. and, and, and as you know. A lot of them uh, shorten their lives because of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I and I appreciate you saying that. There's not enough recognition uh, at, at all. You know, I don't know why. Maybe because the, the NHL was always trying to get fighting out of the game and didn't know how to do it. But uh, yeah. but back, it was, all, it was always such a big part of the game leading up to, I don't huge. know, what, what year. Huge. You know, original six. You know, and it was always an intimidation factor. You know, if you had a yeah. tough team, you got a little more room out there, and a lot of a lot of teams didn't want to come into Boston Garden or Montreal Forum. So, you use no. that to your advantage, and but not so much anymore. But back in those days, yeah. you know, for um, sure, Philadelphia, they, Boston, they, they counted. you know, yeah, they counted. I remember Tim. We, they we always played Philly every year in Providence an exhibition game. You know, so you can imagine, oh. they, you know, in their lineup, you don't know anybody's name. And one year, funny, they, they brought their own Indian. <laughs> yeah. he, did. he looked just like Stan. He was about 5'8", stocky, and they fought. <laughs> Stan beat him, and you never saw him again. But honestly, God, that, yeah. was, that was Philly, right? <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Hey, Tim, Tim, like there was a thing 
it was legit. It was called the Philly flu. Oh, oh and yeah. Yeah, a lot of guys. Yeah, scared it, to we, go. Yeah. He's got, yeah, it was crazy going in that building and Boston. You know, I listen. You can't show it. I mean, I was always nervous going in those buildings, but I, you know, I hit it well. Yeah, and but you got you got to be ready. You know. No, you got, yeah. You be ready. Um, and but you there were guys that. Yeah. When yeah, I, there when were guys. I started with New York. We didn't have a very tough team. We had uh, Ronnie Harris. I don't know if you remember Ronnie, yeah. but he was you know, I know. a pretty big guy. He was tough. He was about our only tough guy, you know. So right near the end of my first year, uh, Schultz uh, elbowed me in the head, turned around and came out. So I just dropped my gloves. And I, I thought I had him, but I, he tied up and I, and I didn't. <laughs> so I, it was funny. So I'm doing a charity thing somewhere, you know, after your career. And I'm with Davey in a bar yeah. somewhere. And I thought having a beer and I, 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 I wanted to see what he would say. So I said, you know, David, I said, you were my first fight in the NHL. And he looks at me and goes, I fought you. <laughs> how did yeah, I like, fight you? really? How did I fight you? <laughs> I said, well, I don't, I don't know, but I bet you I didn't start it. <laughs> I remember that going into Philly there, that Don Seleski, right? Oh, yeah. He was a Big yappy bird. bastard. Yeah, but he was a yappy bastard yeah. in Philly. And yeah. I remember then he got traded to Colorado, I think. Oh, and then yeah. he wanted to be friends with everybody. Oh, yeah, they didn't have yeah. a freak. Yeah, they didn't have a freaking tough guy on the team. Yeah. That, you know, no, I mean, they Schultz, had a Schultz got traded, I think, in 78 or 79 to L.A. And and guys were lining up to get him, you know, because he didn't have any support. Uh, Christ, you know, I I remember going into Boston, right, Tim? They, uh, they had O'Reilly, Cashman, Winsink, Jonathan, and Al Secord. Yeah. Like, come on. Like, yeah. you're going in that building. It's like, hello. Like, and this then, sucks. This is going to suck. <laughs> then what I, the incident I had with Rick, then next thing I know, they called Jay Miller up. Uh, yeah, they I had gave, Curran. I gave they Jay had another. Job. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. He gives he gives us both credit for yeah, that. Yeah, Listen, exactly, what, exactly. It's funny. The next day, the mm. next day, here's what happened. When they called Jay up after – um, the incident between myself and Rick um, and Jay got called up and I knew what he said. Oh my God. I said, now they're going to bring another guy and another guy. I l- listen, I paid for that dearly. I, I, they you know, addressed you know that I, with me. You know what I can never understand is how you and Jay became such good fighters playing college <laughs> hockey where you can't fight. Yeah. <laughs> right. I never understood well, that. Did the yeah, city, yeah, did, did Boston like hate you? At, like, was it tough going home? Oh no, they hated me. Yeah, I they hated me. <laughs> oh yeah, the whole place was chanting "Nylon socks." Tim at the Garden, but I remember Jay gets called up, and Lemaire was coaching at the time, and um, I, I end up getting put on the ice. And Lemaire never would stop me in a like a building like Boston or Philly. He 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 wouldn't stop me. He, he had that respect for me, right? He said, "I'm not going to do that to you." Right. And I'd be at home. I'd be on in the form. I'd go go out in the ice, and if the other team put their tough guy out, well, Lemaire would the, take they me off. The last change, so they can put, put yeah. whoever they want to get. Yeah. yeah. So we're in Boston. I get on the ice, and Jay comes out, and I'm there. Oh, here <laughs> we go. Fuck, I'm I'm still paying for the, the nifty incident. <laughs> and and Jay lines up, and I say to him, I said, "Listen, I know what the fuck you're here for, and we're going as soon as that puck drops." Well, right. boom, the puck went, and I. Dropped my gloves. I went right after him. I grabbed him. Then he dropped. I didn't punch him right away. And then I grabbed him and get to, just to get settled in and get my balance. And then all of a sudden, Curran's coming, the defenseman. He came right oh, at me. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I yeah. I threw it. If you watch, I threw a punch right over Jay's shoulder and got him right in the kisser. Uh, and then I started fighting Jay. Yeah. <laughs> and the next day, the next day I got a call from my father-in-law. And he says to me, God, that Miller guy, what a good guy. He says, uh, he says, he, he said in the newspaper, he said, you know what? I'm because of Rick and, and Chris, I got called up. Yeah. He said, that's why I got called up. Now I have a job in the NHL. He actually said it in the newspaper. Then he ends, so then he, he ends gave up, us credit. Then he ends up playing with Gretzky. <laughs> yeah. Oh, unbelievable wow. story. That is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And we became friends, Jay and I. 
for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, he's a, he's good a great, stuff. He's a super guy. I, I love Jay. Oh, you know, we had him I'm, on here. He was just I'm glad like, I yeah. sacrificed my chiclets so he had a job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Nift, um, <laughs> mom and dad, uh, was there something growing up there? Did your dad kind of want you to follow in his footsteps? He was a, Did he own a printing company or something? Or? No, no. My dad is from Timmins, Ontario. He grew up in a mining town. And yeah. he... Uh, from the story that I, I heard, know, I've been to Timmins. Oh yeah, lovely place. Uh, <laughs> they claim the, the fame of Shania Twain, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's where she's yeah. from. No, but I, the story goes: his dad died at thirteen. He had to he had to quit school, start working, worked the freight boats when he was eighteen on the Great Lakes, and he didn't want to do that the rest of his life. So he got, ended up uh, learning how to be a printer, and then started his one man. He didn't own a company; he owned a one man printing shop. Never played hockey. Yeah. No, but fro- the story goes, he froze a rink in the back. He bought a house in Scarborough in 54. Um, and I was like one. And he froze a rink in the backyard when I was about four. The older kids would take me out skating and shit. But I didn't get into hockey. I got into hockey through baseball, I think, if the story was right. Because my baseball coach, softball coach, was a hockey coach. who talked my dad into bringing me out. So it's ironic that I sucked at baseball. But if I never played baseball. You probably <laughs> never would have played hockey. And, uh, and you know, in, That's those, unbelievable. in those days, uh, in the 60s in Toronto, the Leafs won four cups. So, you know, what are you going to do but play hockey? And then there was only three channels on TV. So I was playing street hockey, road hockey, right in front of my house. We had a brand new suburb of Canada. A lot of kids on the street. We were out there every freaking day. I learned more about the game on the street than I did on the ice. And uh, it just kind of morphed over onto the ice, I think, because I never used tape on my stick. And that had to be (laughs) because you never put tape on your stick playing street hockey because the snow sticks to it all the time. So I think. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. No, I think that's why the no tape. I don't know. It wasn't. That's crazy. I think I wanted to see if I felt the puck better on the ice, like on the on the street. And I did. I didn't have the big slapper or anything. And I, I just this went from there. I never used it again. You know, maybe I was lazy too. I don't know. It's unbelievable. Yeah, like I probably would have. I think the only reason why I taped my stick was because everybody else did. Yeah, yeah. I would, right? If you would have came to training camp with no tape, to. I would have been like, "This guy's cut. Yeah, we gotta get rid of this guy." <laughs> he doesn't know how to put tape on his stick. But yeah, if you look like at, he doesn't even tape on his stick. How if, you if you look at Bobby, Bobby's stick, Bobby used one strip. One. What? Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. where where was the strip at? Super near the heel. No, yeah, near the heel. Yeah. Near the heel. So yeah. it doesn't really near serve a purpose, and not using it served a better purpose than using it. Let's put it that way. I can die a happy man now that my jersey's up in the Raptors. Yeah, the I was going to ask that. Awesome. I mean, and what, what, to what me, would you rather have? Yeah, yeah, I'm from Toronto. I mean, I I would like to be in the Hall of Fame. That would be nice. But, you know, being one of only 12 in the Boston Garden in your home where you played most of your career, I mean, to me, that's the biggest uh, thrill and honor that any athlete can get, I think. So I'm, I'm, I'm good yeah, with that. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm good with that. All right, I'm, I'm going to ask you this, <clears throat> um, and we always hear it. What's a Bruin? What, what does it take to be a Boston Bruin, Nifty? Well, total, like, total commitment. You know, um, what, what, what was great about the Bruins, and still is, and I don't know, maybe Montreal lost it a little bit, is the continuation of that theme of their players. Like they went from, you know, the early, the big bad Bruins of the early 70s to the, the Bruins, the launch pale gang in the, in the 80s. And then Ray comes in and he's obviously the new guy. And, and, you know, T- Terry was the, the inspirational leader on the team. You know, he didn't expect everybody to play like him, but you better put an effort in every night. And if you don't, I mean, you're not going to be on the team much longer. And uh, when he was a coach, there was a couple guys that weren't doing the effort the right way, and they were gone. And they ended up history. He I know. had a say then, right? Yeah. And then, you know, Millbury might have continued that. You played, you played under Millbury, right? I love yeah. playing for Millbury. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Mike was 
born of that same era, you know. And so that keep, kept continuing right up until Marshawn, Bergeron, Chara. They lost it a little bit in the 90s. You know, Cam ended up getting hurt, and after he was gone, Ray tried to continue it. And uh, they just yeah. they didn't do anything for him, and he ended up leaving. But uh, after, I, and I hate to say it, after they did the salary cap, it worked for the league. Everybody's making money. The Bruins all of a sudden spent to the top. They went out and got Chara and Shirelli, and they, and they ended up winning the cup. And now they've continued that whole new era right into, you know, today's game, uh, t- today's team. So it's really just the continuation of what a Bruin is about. And they always like to talk about that. And But it's true. And sometimes it doesn't work, but they've been able to do it. And uh, I yeah, they have. I hope the new leaders. I hope they are able to get new guys in, like a McAvoy or whatever, that will continue that. Uh, you know, that carry thought. that mantle the of man- what it is mantle. to and, be a. And brother. they look back and they see us. You know, we were just doing the era nights, and they they comment that they love to see how involved all the older guys are. That they're still here and they're coming in here and. Uh, See, that is, that's just an awesome thing to hear because I'm going to tell you, and Jeff Gordon and Hughes have kind of brought it back a little bit. Some of the players are around more. When Bergevin was here, he didn't want the older guys around because he felt that it put too much pressure on the kiddies, you know? And I get it. It's their yeah, time. Don't I don't want to be there. Anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, honestly, no one – Guys just weren't around, and yeah, and that's too bad. You weren't, you didn't feel welcome. That's too bad. Which which really, um, there was a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of trust there for some reason. But even, even you know, I, still I, like that now, Knox. Yeah. It's still no, like that, no, no. Jeff Gordon and and Ken Hughes have have certainly uh, made the the retired Are guys, any, the alumni, any of the feel 70s welcome. Seventies guys around, like there's Larry or. Uh... Uh, well, Larry's down Do in Florida, agree? but uh, Yvonne, La- Yvonne Lambert's oh, always around. Ray yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. It's, it's a short flight. Well, some of is short flight home. <laughs> well, you got to work. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm still up here freezing my balls off. <laughs> you can uh, do that but, from Florida. What that's you're why doing. we're doing this yeah. show. We want to get down to Florida. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Niff, yeah, I was made an ambassador here with the Habs with Carbono and. And oh, and Brisbois and Domfu, so which yeah. was quite an honor for me. First yeah. English guy ever, right. and first right. American. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. Uh, you that's know, great. I love the organization. Um, they gave me my my opportunity, yeah. which was incredible. And, uh, and yeah, they're, I, they're I'm, the winningest organization in the game in the history. So you're part yeah. of history. I mean, that's something to be. Really yeah, proud of. and it's nice. It's nice to um Original to six. finally see them at least trying to rebuild this thing the way it should be. And hopefully they'll get there at some yeah. point. That rivalry can be reignited that would at be some nice. point. Yeah. yeah. Listen, um, I want to ask you, obviously, when in retirement, you know, you've been in charge of alumni for years and um, you have this affinity for Boston. You love Boston and I don't oh, yeah. blame it. My hometown. I friggin' love it too, yeah, and I miss it. Great sports town, right? Great sports town. Yeah. Everybody's been spoiled um, this century because they won too many times. So. Oh my God. I, I know. It's right? crazy. Oh, it's crazy. We expect it every year. Yeah. So. The success that those teams have had, and it's great for the fan base for sure. Yeah. Um, but you did some coaching. I, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of it. You coached the U.S. sledge hockey team, yeah. uh, right? You coached them to a gold medal in the Olympics. Yeah. And um, Paralympics. You, you're going to be doing a um, um, uh, documentary on them? I'll, I'll do Is a, that it? No, it's a, it's a full uh, a movie. A movie, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, t- I'll, mm-hmm. I'll be as quick as I can about this. but No, so, that's okay. So no, happened, we got time. Yeah. What happened was in 2001, I was in my house and a phone rang, and it was a buddy of mine. And he's on the, he was on Paul Edwards. He was on the U.S. disabled ski team. And he tell, he's on the phone, he just says, hey, I just found out the U.S. national sled hockey team's looking for a coach. Their coach quit in the world championships, and they don't have a coach. And they're going to Salt Lake City in the Paralympics next year. Would you be interested? And, he, and then he says, you do know what sled hockey is, right? And I froze for a minute because I had not <laughs> a clue. 
But I thought if I said no, he said, oh, well, never mind. So I said, yeah, I know what slide hockey is. So anyway, long story short, <laughs> I, I, got, I got the job. I figured I heard hockey and Paralympics, and that's, to me, you know, how tough could it be, right? So as it turned out, they never won a game in their history. Nagano was their first Paralympics. The World Championships, they didn't win a game. And now they're a team in shambles. And so we had our selection camp. There's more to the story, but you got to watch the movie. Yeah. So um, the selection camp was August 01 in Buffalo. And I had to pick 15 guys, two goalies, 13 skaters. And uh, there was, I saw some good talent out there. Uh, and um, we're supposed to play a tournament in Montreal against Canada, Japan, and ourselves on September 13th. And then 11 happened. So... Oh. They shut the airspace down, as you know. We never went to Canada. We never played another team until we got into Salt Lake City. All we had wow. was a, one wow. camp each month from Thursday to Sunday in Boston, Minnesota, Chicago, Dallas. And then six months later, we go into Salt Lake City as the sixth seed because they're only invited because they were the host team because they never won a game. So we know I was just didn't want to be embarrassed. And these guys had never been taught a system. So my assistant coach, Tommy Moulton, good friend of mine, big hockey guy, uh, decided we're going we're gonna to spend all our time teaching them a simple system. So we taught them the Don Cherry dump and run because it was very <laughs> – no, because I'm figuring sled hockey, most of the goals like women's hockey come from 10 feet around the net, right? You don't have the big slap shots. And if you don't get the puck down low, you're not going to score any goals. So you got to go in and bang them. So that's what we did. Dump it in, go in, bang them, get the puck, move it around. And we ended up winning all five of our, our games, oh. beating number one seed Canada 5-1 in front of 6,000 people at the youth center. And went on to play in the gold medal game against Norway, who won the gold medal in Nagano. Went, we were up 3-1 in the second period. They tied at 3-3. We tired. Over 8,000 people at the East Center. Largest crowd to ever see a sled hockey game, I'm, I'm told. And went into overtime, 10-minute overtime. Still tied. Went into a five-man shootout. I had never been in a shootout in my life. And I had to make <laughs> the list out before the game. And we lost the flip in the shootout, so we had to go first. And it went down to the last shooter. I mean, if you wrote this, it would sound phony, but that's what happened. And we won the gold medal uh, in a shootout. That's nuts. And they never won a game in their history. And since then, they won a bronze in, in Italy in uh, Italy in 2006, and they won four golds in a row. They're the winningest sled hockey team in the world. Canada can't even touch them. I know. I've, I've seen them. I've seen the games, Canada, U.S., and they're violent. Oh, they're yeah, nasty no. games, right? What a lot Talk of people about don't realize is they're, you know, they're only two feet off the ice, right? Uh, and so when you hit the boards, that's where the stanchions are. The boards are designed yeah. to give up here, not down yeah. there. And it's like hitting a brick yeah. wall. And some of yeah. them, they break their ankles. Some of them are paralyzed. A lot of them, most of them are double lamps today. And uh, yeah. a lot of veterans, too, coming back from the wars. We didn't really have – we had one, a goalie. But, um, no, and our average age was 34. We had the grandfathers wow. of sled hockey on our What team a story. Yeah, there's a lot it, of shit talking out there. They'd be pretty competitive. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. And, and two penalties <laughs> they have. They, they, they have these picks on the end of their sticks, like razor blades. But you're, and they, can you jab people with them? Oh, oh they're <laughs> coming off like bleeding eight, all the time. Is there any tryouts I can do? Oh, oh yeah. yeah and, right? and the other one is T-boning. You're not supposed to run your sled into a guy. But what they would do is they'd kick the end of the sled up, and they'd hit you in, the, in their stomach to knock your wind out, oh. and they'd hit you in the side to, in the kidneys. Yeah, so it gets a little dirty <laughs> out there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. So, so Niff, um, coaching that uh, uh, sledge hockey team, like systems, you said dump and chase and all that. Um, how many guys, I guess, played the game on the ice before the accidents? Well, did that's you a have a few? Good, or? Very good question. And the thing is that I didn't. When I met these guys, I didn't go around asking them about their injuries. Like some, honest with God, out of 15 guys, two of them were train accidents, if you can believe that. 
and one was uh, polio, one was spina bifida, you know, so I wasn't going to, I didn't know, I didn't need to know their whole story. So, yeah. you know, um, but since then I've got to know exactly, you know, what happened to a lot, uh, most of them because we're doing the, the movie and, and so you got to know. And yeah. uh, my captain, Joe Howard, who's from Boston, uh, they just retired his jersey in the Weymouth rink a couple months ago. Yeah, down cool. For, yeah. That's where he grew up playing hockey, your, your, to your question. But he lost his legs jumping trains at the age of 15. Him and his buddies on the way home from high school. And they greased the rails, I'm told. And he'd slide in yeah. and, uh, and lost his legs, you know. Um, and then he didn't find sled hockey till he was 29. Terry O'Reilly actually visited him at Shriners Hospital when he was in the hospital after that. Terry remembers it very well. And they had a relationship wow. over the years. And this, ironically, I became his coach and I made him captain. So he was the captain of the gold medal team. Uh, it's, so it's awesome cool. Story. What a story. Yeah. And the, the, team and just, I... the team just got inducted into the U.S. Na uh, Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame last year in Colorado Springs, the first Paralympic team to ever be inducted. Did you go out for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's that so awesome. cool. Yeah, Wait, uh, that's so isn't cool. it? Yeah, that's that's cool. so. It must be so fulfilling to be able to get a group of guys. Listen, I coached a little bit yeah. in the East Coast Hockey League. I had two years. I absolutely loved it. I have guys today talking about those two years. They call me and say, "Hey, coach, this and that." I'm in touch with a lot of the guys that played for me back then. Yeah, and I got to tell you, when they finally get what you want them to do as a group yeah it feels good right oh. so obviously you did in in record time well i mean well, you know we did, we did it you know while we're playing we never played yeah anybody. so the, the first game was against japan with about 12 people in the audience at 9 a.m right and we're yeah. zero zero going in the third period and i said to my i said i said we don't beat these guys. Might as well just go home. I mean, we can't even get a pawns, right? And we scored three in the third Definitely period. wasn't a Herb Brooks speech. <laughs> yeah. well, I didn't right. come up with we many of those. Well... <laughs> my, my assistant had the best one before the gold medal game. He says, if you guys lose, it'll suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, your movie's not going to be like these inspirational <laughs> moments. I think they're going to have to make up a couple of good lines for oh, us. That's but, amazing. Uh, so what well, happened I'm was, sure they will. We uh, seven years ago we started trying to write a script, and it just never got anywhere through COVID. So we got rid of our, our producers. We got two new producers about a year ago. Wrote a new script. We like it, and we're going with it. We're in pre-production right now. So, which whatever that's that awesome. What's <laughs> What what's the name of the film going to be? Uh, tough sledding. Tough sledding. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to certainly keep my, keep my eye out for it for sure. Thank and I, you. I'd love to maybe have you back on when it comes out. We can talk about it. I'd love. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we'll talk definitely about, see it. We could talk about your roller hockey career. Is this real, right? Too? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know what? You know the internet. <laughs> Try to get something taken <laughs> off of it. No, I never went to, I was never a roller hockey player in Toronto. No, but what I did do that wasn't That's like on three there, games, no goals. I mean, I, don't I, know. I know that's why they fired me. But no, what I did do that's not on there at the end of my career, Harry bought me out of my option year with 12 points from a thousand. Thanks, Harry. Right. So, oh. so I decided I, him and I had a verbal deal. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go to Europe and I'll play, stay in shape. I'll come back down the stretch because they end early. So I ended up going to Switzerland for two months. I played at the end of my career at 35 years old in the B league. They ever seven goals against the game. Coach couldn't speak English. I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I came home and retired. But yeah, you, well, you, I, they don't even have the right information on there. And I called them to, <laughs> to change it. And they never called me back. <laughs> DB, right? It's on DB. Yeah, I, they, DB. That's how I'm looking like, well, yeah. you know, roller hockey career. So I, know, I feel good now. <laughs> Nifty saying I should have never went over there when I I got the invitation to go to Bolzano. I'm glad I didn't go now. Wow. <laughs> if, if Nifty couldn't make it there. Well, oh. well Bolzano was you in know? the A-League in Italy. It would have been beautiful, right? I'm, yeah, playing, right? I'm playing in Bullock in the B-League, and they, they average <laughs> seven goals against a game. And, the, and our goalie played senior hockey in Toronto. <laughs> Wait, where in Switzerland? The Bull? The Bull? Uh, that's Switzerland? It's north of Zurich. 
Uh, okay. Cloton is where Zurich Airport yep, is, yep. and Bullock is the next farm town north of that. I was going to say because I played in I played in Old or um, Lugano. Oh, you did. Uh, okay, in the A League. Yeah, so You're I was in the A League with the Yeah, two, but then yeah. I played one B one year in the B League in the in Olton. I don't know who no, that no, is. No, it's cool. it's kind of like similar. It's like by it's yeah. Who knows? It's my last game was in Geneva. I scored two goals in the third period for a six-six tie, and we're out of the playoffs. It was January fifth. <laughs> <laughs> I flew home January sixth. <laughs> God, it's beautiful uh, over there, though, right? It's well, got to be gorgeous. Well, right? here's a, a quick story. Bobby Miller was coaching in a little town called Sierra down in the Alps. So I'd have yeah. Sundays off, so I'd hop on the train. It's a three-hour train ride down to Sierra. We'd drink all day Sunday in the wee hours, and he'd pour me on the train at 7.30 the next morning because I had to be back <laughs> on the ice by noon, so they'd give me my paycheck, right? So I'm, I'm going through the Alps hung over like a bear, but it was beautiful. Going through the Alps by train. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Best thing it, is be- it is beautiful. It's, it's, it's nothing like it. All right. Hey, Nifty. Um, I got one last one for you, and it's um, – I want to know if you could write the first line of your eulogy, what would it be? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the first, I, it would have to be a funny line. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. Because I would want it to be funny. I would, uh, and I would have a buddy of mine do the eulogy, and maybe Gresh, because we go back so far, and, and he would know this. I would say that, you know, everybody knew Rick as Nifty, but his real nickname was Silky. There we go. All right. We got it. And, and I'll, tell it. You, I'll tell you who Silky was. We're in a we're in a strip joint in in Long Island one day. The whole team was there. Oh, right? this is beautiful. And this is beautiful. So this is my first year. You know, Gresh is a rookie, and um, the stri- stripper comes down over and talks to us. This is my memory of it anyway. And I had long blonde hair down on my shoulders in those days, and so did she. Yeah. And her stage name was Silky, right? <laughs> so who starts naming me Silky but Peter Stumkowski starts calling me Silky but the trouble was it wasn't a she it was a he so I was <laughs> I was I was nicknamed after a transvestite stripper okay so there you go <laughs> oh, it sounds oh, like awesome. sounds like Gresh I told, Schnur, Tom, I told Tom Laidlaw that on his podcast he was roaring he was Schnur, Schnur. So you the can ask Gresh oh. about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I will. And I'm going to, certainly I'll talk to him in the the, the next week or so for yeah. sure. I, okay. I, stay in, I, I stay in touch with my roomie, my former roomie. <laughs> he was awesome, Schnur. Yeah. yeah. God, funny guy. Yeah, I Good always, soil. I, always I, I got traded and he married Carol all. So, you know, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Silky went up the road. Listen, uh, Nifty, thanks so much for joining us. Again, I, I mean and meant every word I said. I'm so happy you, your number's up there. You thanks, should bro. be in the Hall of Fame. And again, yeah. you know, uh, I I'm, I was an asshole for doing what I did to you. Well, it was I a was. lot of years ago, yeah. and, and yeah. probably not too many years from now, I won't even remember it. <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, hey, thanks so much, Nifty. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.